Okay, hello everyone. This started as a talk that I gave in Atlanta, and it was just a little overview of DriveChain, but it included many misconceptions, and I've substantially expanded the talk, and I'd like to just give it again very quickly, and right now I'm in a, I'm traveling, I'm in a hotel room, so I'm just going to try and bang this out in one go, and what you see is what you get, basically, but DriveChain is a very important project. It, um could potentially solve scalability, both the contention as well as providing us with infinite block space as the altcoins already provide us with. Um, those are two completely separate things as I'm going to explain on a later slide. But even as I explained in my Milan talk at Scaling 3, the infinite block size that DriveChain can provide is even better than what we would get if we just removed the block size in Bitcoin completely which is not something that I advocate, but I think it's just weird how important this project is and how there's a disparity between how much effort people are willing to put in to understanding it versus what they, uh, how comfortable they feel with kind of criticizing it. So, but in addition to solving scalability, it can solve governance and it can protect developers from coercion, uh, from the hard fork uh, threat, and it can also protect all of us from a competition uh, in the altcoin market. So it's a kind of a, a tremendously important project and there is a shocking degree to which it is just not understood at all. And, you know, I have, an I have just so many examples of this in the presentation, but I do want to start with one before I very much begin. And, um, I'm going to go over to it right now, which is where it says, yeah, Jorge Tamon, as of this morning, believes that, so he says he, is, he hasn't had time to review the idea. It was published in November 2015, so he's a clearly a very busy guy. But he says he hasn't fully read it, but I think I have a general understanding of drive chains. Perhaps you can confirm I'm not wrong answering a few questions. Question number one is, Drive chains require all miners to validate the side chain to be sure you won't produce an, a Bitcoin invalid block, which is just like, just crazy. But that's nothing compared to what happens next, which is that this guy, Mr. Hoddle, says, he admits that he hasn't read anything about drive chain. And then um, the guy says, well, then why are you talking about it? Which is a very good point. And then Mr. Hoddle says, because I'm not a fan of any changes that gives miners more power well, I mean, how do you know that if you haven't read it? And in fact, it's not correct. It, my, it, that is just a, a falsehood, as I'm going to explain in this talk. Uh, and as this guy, me, me Campbell Soup, says, the claim that it gives him more powers is untrue, which it is untrue. And then Mr. Harlow says, if only miners validate sidechains, yes, it's true. And this, the miners are not even validating sidechains. So this is like, it's just a weird, shocking thing that people feel that they, there's just a, the vast misunderstanding is so extreme that I think you'll really enjoy this, this presentation. So first things first, um, before I really start the presentation in earnest, I do kind of want to just respond to this, which is to say that this meme about drive chain giving miners more power is false. Um, this is taking something that I use to try to help explain drive chain to people, which is how do we get all this flexibility from altcoins into the system? And they they cherry pick this little thing that I say, which is common to all sidechain designs. By definition, it must be, as I will explain. And as I do explain in my November 2015 post, so I don't really even know why I'm even making this video, but you know maybe it will help. Who knows? Um, people prefer videos these days, I guess. It's and I get to update things too, so this is good. This will be this will be better than the November 2015 blog post, uh, I think, because we'll have all the criticism in it as well. But the point is that there's this thing, um, which I call the optionality criterion, which is a good thing, as I will explain, that people want, and then they misconstrue it to say miners give people more power because what the whole point of sidechains is that the full node is not doing the validation, but you can't have nothing do the validation, so we try to set things up so that the validation gets done anyway. Um, but I would rephrase this meme about drive chain giving miners more power, since it's apparently um, spread like wildfire. I would at least combat it by saying that you could instead say something else, which is to say that drive chain allows users to choose to make a certain gamble 
the risk of that gamble is that I, all starts, am, am correct about a given minor strategy being objectively the most profitable. So maybe I'm wrong about that. That's the risk you take. But the reward for that gamble is you get unlimited technical flexibility without the need to bother everyone else. So it's, it's permissionless, but it's also protecting uh, Bitcoin from being harassed by all these hard fork um, complaints and things. So the, the, uh, and these campaigns is what I meant to say. So these, this green box down here are saying letting users gamble that a mining policy is objectively the most profitable. That is, that's really not only is that true of just about everything in the world of blockchain, but it's indistinguishable from the Lightning Network. And so for some reason, people buy the claim on the Lightning Network, but they don't buy it with DriveChain. And I think it's just because they don't understand it. And I have a table that's going to directly compare the two. Now, I think most of these people are lost cause um, because it's human nature to just double down when you're proven wrong. And I think that there there is really no hope for these people other than to perhaps give them an out by letting them like lay the blame on me and say that I didn't explain it very well. And it's not until they heard my great train metaphor that it all made sense. And so it's my fault for not explaining it, which is fine with me, but I just think that oftentimes, I mean, this, well, we'll talk about this later. So, but I'm not sure these people can be convinced, but maybe their mistakes will be useful for um, you and the audience. I don't know. Okay, so here's the, the presentation. Here's the real beginning of the presentation. So the real beginning of the presentation is that why do we need side chains at all? This is Sergio Damon Lerner writing to Bitcoin Dev talking about Segwit2x. He says there's two groups of people that have two different visions for Bitcoin. And then he says that both the visions have their merits, but they are incompatible visions. And um, then Luke Dash Jr. Uh, so like Luke Dash Jr. and Adam Back, they both understand drive chain, but almost everyone else has these flaws that I will expose in this presentation that are just, they're just shockingly bad. It's just people have not read a line of code or a single word of anything that I've written ever. It's just so mistaken. But Luke does understand what's going on. And he says, these visions are not fundamentally incompatible. And then he says, he brings up Paul Stortz's drive chain concept. Um, and he does a very good job of summarizing what it is. And then he says, by using a drive chain, it is in fact possible to achieve two blockchains, achieving the goals of each group both remaining part of the same Bitcoin network and using the same Bitcoins. So thank you, Luke, for saying that. Um, Adam Back also um, understands, as I mentioned, first of all, Luke, oh, this is up at the top, the rectangle at the top there. Luke's post was then sticky by Thamos, or at least he allowed it to remain sticky for uh, two weeks at the top of our Bitcoin. It got 570 points and 91% upvoted. There are actually a lot of people who, not just Reddit users, but there are a lot of people who support this project, but they are, you know, too um, uncomfortable speaking in public um, as a result of all the crazy knowledge that, crazy memes about this project that are false but spreading. So, but someone who is not infected by false memes is Adam Back, and he, this is a tweet from him to. Uh, Jihan Wu saying that the best chance for scaling is lightning and drive chain um, because they scale in two different ways as I will explain very briefly in the, in the near future so um, the agenda for the talk is going to be a review of side chains because even though the critics probably think they know it um, I think it's just better for everyone if we just can put this make this presentation just like the one thing that people kind of should watch first um, and then after we talk about side chains in general, we'll talk about drive chain specifically. And then I'm going to talk about the security model of drive chain. Then I'm going to talk about blind merge mining. In fact, I probably won't because there's so much to talk about. And I guess that deserves its own presentation. But I'll scroll slowly through the slides so that you can read them. Or maybe I'll just blur through it. And then I have some helpful comparisons, which I think really will help at the very end. So what are side chains? So this is from the project website, which... I encourage you to read. And let all the, if you don't read it, you're in danger of sending a tweet that I may quote and put in into a video. So that's why you should read the site. 
And DriveChain allows multiple blockchains to all agree to share the same 21 million Bitcoins. The networks are otherwise autonomous. So basically, anything that's true of an altcoin is probably true of a sidechain, which immediately underscores most of the criticism of sidechains being ridiculous because um, who's stopping them from doing the same thing on an altcoin? No one or nothing. And even there's a, cons a comparison with Counterparty that I will draw later that um, will make that even more dire. So what is the point? Well, uh, I think there are a lot, there are a lot of points. Um, this is a graphic I put on the website. Basically, what we want is to remove the incentive for people to campaign on these different monetary networks because that's a source of a lot of scamming and a lot of um, competition that does not actually achieve anything. So we want ideas to compete in a meritocracy and we want the technology to compete, but we don't actually want the monetary networks to compete because they are a function of the status quo and of, and of people's general persuadability and of getting things to change. And that um, is not effective competition. It's a, that is a zero-sum game, and that is uh, pointless. And by Metcalf's law, we want all the network value to be pooled into one uh, monetary system. Um, so what I, at the top, I have a blue box that says popularity changes the location, not the price. So the idea is that if someone wants Bitcoin Cash and they campaign for it, over on the left, on, on CoinMarketCap, you would... Um, what you would have would be the, big, the price of Bitcoin Cash going up and the price of other things going down, which is ironically what's happening in that screenshot that I took a while ago. Um, so that's what would happen today. But what instead, the vision is for the, the 21 million coins to move around. So if you look at the very bottom of, on the right there where it says grand total, you can see there's the 21 million Bitcoins. You can see that 4.3 million have not yet been mined. And so there's 6.6 .6 million just floating around here in space. And the vision is for, in a sidechain world, those coins to travel around. They wouldn't all be in Bitcoin Core like the way they are today. They would travel to different networks and hang out there. And there would be no, um, people would feel comfortable only competing on the technology and not on other factors, such as how much marketing, for example, Dashcoin can do, which we know is a lot, or how many weird claims Ethereum can make. So so that's the vision. Um, of course, the point is, yeah, Metcalf's Law. Uh, second point is that um, right now, although the altcoins give, give us um, a lot of experimentation and they technically do give an infinite block size, which, you know, however you feel about that is uh, up to you, but um, people have all this these, the option to use an altcoin uh, and all the transaction fees for those transactions do not go to the Bitcoin miners. They go to the altcoin miners. So our hash rate is lower than it would be otherwise. Uh, and then third is, yes, an existential threat. So, you know, however unlikely it may be, if a competitor, for example, Ethereum uh, displaces Bitcoin, uh, and which could theoretically happen. I mean, there could be like some kind of government action against Bitcoin, but not Ethereum. And then there could just be so much hype related growth. But whatever the point may be, however likely you think this is, um, if uh, an altcoin has superior technology, then Bitcoin will just be um, obliterated in the long run because there can only be one uh, currency of the internet, in my opinion. Now, but the second important thing to bring up is that there is a difference between scalability and the scalability contention, which is to say why people are fighting versus a dry engineering topic of transactions per se second metric. The true cause of the scalability contention is that people are different, which is what Sergio was saying when I opened this presentation. But people are different, but the blockchain requires 100% consensus. And... The Lightning Network does nothing to address the scalability contention because the Lightning Network doesn't change the fact that people are different. So this metric of scalability, transactions per second, that's kind of like looking at things for miles per gallon and you're changing the efficiency of your car. But 
what the, the contention is really about is the fuel tank size in gallons, and that is decentralization. And what I mean by that is scalability debate isn't about scalability, it's about decentralization, which is how much a node should cost to run. So imagine if the current transactions per second was one transaction per second, and then Lightning Network multiplied that by a billion. So now it's a billion transactions per second. You could still have someone like Roger Vera who, would, who could say, with some justification, well, what's so special about 1 billion? He could say, well, why not 16 billion? Or why not 100 billion? Or why not a trillion? You know? I mean, after all, why not? Uh, 1 trillion is bigger than, you know, a billion. But in contrast to that, Luke Jr. could say, well, now that we've made all this progress, we really need to cut things back. You know, we really need to cut it back from a billion to 300 million or something. And it's because they disagree over the node resources question. Everyone wants scalability to go up. That's not why people are um, fighting with each other. And so no, nothing improving transactions per second, unless you reach, of course, an infinite transactions per second, which we're not going to do ever because the universe is finite. But unless you reach infinite transactions per second scalability, then no amount of scalability is really going to ultimately solve this problem, especially as Bitcoin grows and includes more and more people who are just bound inevitably to be uh, different from each other. So what what I'm saying um, is that we want, but yeah, so side chains can solve the, this scalability contention because they address the fact that people are, are different. So I'm going to go a little bit into um, the design strategy before we get into all the criticism and the things that people don't understand. So we're almost there if you want that. This is the last slide, I think, actually, before <clears throat> I go into that. So the design philosophy of DriveChain notices a lot of things. The first is that altcoins themselves are already very similar to sidechains. They're basically everything sidechains are, but there are three changes that you need to make. The first is that the altcoins print their own money. They have their own coin-based transaction. They print their own Ether or they print their own you know, Dashcoin or whatever it is. The second difference is that they reliably have their own miners or their own consensus system. Um, and the third is that they don't have this, this accounting rule that I was talking about before. So let me go back to, you can see on this, oops, sorry, here it is. So this is this table I'm talking about here. We want when, if you if coins leave some network, they have to arrive somewhere else. And if they leave that network, they have to go back. So that's all I'm saying. Um, so the, uh, what I have here, uh, I think I can, well, I, won't, I don't want to use the pointer thing because I think it's distracting. So in section one, um, the you see I have part three divided into A and B, which is that the main chain balance goes down by one, the side chain balance goes up by one, side chain balance goes down by one, the main chain balance goes up by one. So that's all I'm saying is that there's, there's two things there. And the first one I've coded in green, the Coinbase transaction, the little green rectangle, because um, it it's very easy to fix that first one. You just go into the code and just rip that part out. That takes like, you know, five minutes. Uh, but in, yeah, but what's interesting is that we have, um, yeah, so having existing ingredients at the top of this slide because we have two other things that will get us almost all the way there in the last two. And the first is called embedded consensus, or at least it was, I don't know, the terminology is kind of messed up in this space, but Basically, what it is is something like Counterparty, where that protocol includes the Bitcoin protocol, as you can see there. And you can see I have a little arrow to indicate that Counterparty must process all of the crazy of Bitcoin. But the reverse is not the case. So Counterparty is watching Bitcoin very carefully and knows everything that Bitcoin does. Um, and uh, it can react to that or do something that... Uh, is a function of what happens in Bitcoin, but the reverse is not the case. Um, but it has two interesting side effects. One is that it inherits the consensus from Bitcoin, because Bitcoin chooses the transaction order, and counterparties' transactions are a subset of Bitcoin transactions. So this is a kind of merged mining in a way. It's uh, I wouldn't want to go back belabor the differences between the two, but it's it is kind of very, it's very similar, and I look forward to explaining that in the future if people are confused about it, but I don't want to talk about it right now. And the other thing is the fact that the protocol is asymmetric means that the deposits, 
which is that first triangle, are, are very easy to do. Um, because all you have to do is watch the, I mean, well, you already are watching everything, so you can watch for deposits um, very easily. So, so that part is that work part works great, and so that's why we get most of our things shaded in there. We just have one last triangle that we need to shade in, and we are going to sh give it partial credit with these instant atomic cross chain swaps, which we will be returning to, because they are zero trust, simple, and fast. So they work really well. They work in both directions. The only problem is that they're not pegged. You can't force them to be at a one-to-one -one rate. As I'm going to explain, that results in an epistemic contradiction. But the point is, it's no good to have it only work one way because we want to hedge all of the altcoin-related price risk. We want all that to be gone so that stuff can just compete on the technology alone. Now, we may not succeed in getting all of it, of course, but this is not, not enough to just do a one-way peg. The trick is to do the two-way peg and have them come back. It's easy to send them into the abyss of counterparty, but you've got to get them back somehow. That's the trick. Okay, now before I talk about that, we have lots of complicated things to talk about. So there's going to be eight difficult slides coming up, and I'm going to show you what they are right now. And then I'm going to go over them very slowly. So here, here they are. And um, you'll see that many of them are actually the same slide, just getting more complicated. So here's the first slide. Here's the second slide. Here is the third slide of the complex slides. Here is the fourth. Here is the fifth with Peter Todd. Here is the sixth with Peter Todd in the front and something in the back. And then here's the back part in slide seven. And uh, here is with the destination of this part which is that there are mutually exclusive criteria in this design. So this is where we're going. We're going to mutually exclusive criteria with two zones, and you can only make some people happy. You cannot make everyone happy. And that is where this is going. So now let me explain these slides. Hmm. Okay, so this these eight slides are just me pointing out that the sidechain must be optional like multiple times in a row. So the sidechain must be optional. Look for that pink... Uh, color, it's kind of the theme of these eight slides, and it will return all the time because it's a very important point. Um, the main chain must process withdrawals blind to what is going on in the side chain. Now, in practice, it will know a few things, but the the load on the, the hit to decentralization will be um, it will be totally gated and 100% commence. There will be no actual marginal effort required on anyone's computer that will change as a result of what's going on in the sidechain. So that's what I mean by blind to the sidechains. You won't, you won't get any of the messages on the sidechain. You won't have any idea what's going on over there. Now, if that weren't the case, it would be a de facto hard fork, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid in the first place, which is what Jorge Timon apparently didn't know as of this morning, which is shocking. Um, so you can't have something be opt-in unless people are out by default. Otherwise, it would be opt-out. And opt out, it wouldn't be that bad, but um, that would be uh, there would be some confusing questions about exactly how that would be done. So we got to get we got to go for opt in, and we want in order for there to be opt in, everyone has to be out by default. And so since the side chain is optional, the main chain has to be uh, totally ignorant of. You see these two histories down here, a Roman numeral one on the left, Roman numeral two on the right. Um, the sidechain is not going to know what's going on there. So an invalid withdrawal, which is the one on, on the right, that we know is invalid because there is no H on the sidechain at all. You notice in the, in the left, in both of them, we have A, money going from person A to person B, and then person B sends the money to himself on the sidechain. He transfers the money. Same owner. And then on the sidechain, B sends to C, sends to D, sends to E and F. Now, E and F are withdraw correctly on the left, but on the right, something else is happening altogether, where H is claiming that all the money is his, or hers, I suppose. But H is stealing the money is the point. Um, but the thing about this is if the side chain is optional, the main chain has to know what to do. Given that, it has no way of discriminating between these two histories. And so I've kind of, I think, oh, wait, I've got one more slide before I put up the veil here. But I will put up a veil. In a moment, I'm going to put up a veil over this, and you won't see anything. But for now, you can still see everything, so memorize it quickly. 
Now the this blue box, what am I saying here? So this is what I mentioned before, which is that the transactions must be free to go anywhere because we don't know what will happen on the side chain that might rearrange the ownership. Who knows who might end up owning the coins over there? It could be anyone. So in order for us to succeed, we need to get the we need to have a lot of transaction flexibility. Now the thing is though that the we cannot constrain the destination of this money with node validation because that defeats the entire point of the sidechain. That would make the sidechain not optional. As I mentioned before, if we do absolutely nothing, then anyone can immediately steal the Bitcoin. And this is the error that um, Greg Slepek made, among other errors, but also Giacomo Zucco made it as of this morning. He, I, you know, it's like I can't even believe. So these people think that um, instead of having full nodes validate the chain and protect us against miners, they think that instead we do nothing to stop the miners from stealing the funds. But that's not true. We're going to do quite a bit, and that's this train metaphor that I thought of while I was on the plane to Atlanta. So I think um, people haven't seen this metaphor before, so I hope they find it to be enlightening. But the point is, it's not going to be completely unrestrained. We are going to do something called SPV validation. We're going to say that scarce, non-reusable proof of work has been done on these side domain transfers. And you can see for yourself after I explain it whether or not you buy this, but that's not the point of this section. The point of this section is just to emphasize this optionality concept and that it, how it is actually mutually exclusive with perfect security so that we have this pink color again is sort of the theme, um, which is this ignorance mandate. So if you do want to know which withdrawals are valid on the sidechain, then you have to run the sidechain node. It's already doing everything that it can to inform you on what's valid and invalid, and it's already working as hard as it can. And it's you know it's not like there's inefficiencies there that are systemic. So if you want to know, you run the node. All of this technology right here, the sidechains technology, as you'll see, hopefully, is for people who don't want to run the sidechain node. In other words, it's for the people who don't want to know. And there are many of you out there. So as you see, I placed this veil over over the, the sidechain. And in we see that in one case, B is being spent to EF. And in the other case, B is being spent to H. And one of these is sidechain theft. But which one? That is the question. Now we have something here because of uh, Peter Todd's perfectionism, which I respect, although I think that Peter Todd could do more to clarify what he means on this trade-off because what happens is that, as you'll see, you get misunderstood both on the optionality side and on the security side, and people each assume the worst. When you've actually done the best you can, on both dimensions they just assume the worst, and I think Peter Todd should really help me out um, by clarifying exactly what his objection is, which I'll get to in the next slide. Um, but there's a, an effect here, which I call users affect miners affect users, which I call USAMUS, not to be confused with Samus Aran, um, famous biologist and Chozo historian over there in that little window. But if that helps you remember it, then that would be great. And I think I usually use this orange color to talk about this. So what's going on is that some users affect all the miners thanks to this effect of the intransigent minority. If you don't know what that is, you should read Nassim Taleb and then think about what you were doing talking about sidechains without reading Nassim Taleb because that's a mistake. But uh, one example of this happening is the user activated soft fork itself. So you have to think about this because it's, it's pretty important. And since something has affected all the miners, it then will affect all users because uh, users want to know, users of a full node are running it primarily so that they can determine whether or not they have been paid Bitcoin or whether or not they own Bitcoin so that they can give up some service or some other property or something. So in order to do that, they need to know the status of this payment. And in order to know that, they need to know the status of the block that it's in. And then specifically, they need to know whether or not they can expect this block to be in the longest valid chain. 
Now, the problem is that if minors are persuaded to follow different rules that are compatible with yours but tighter, so the UASF point, if minors are persuaded to follow different rules, then you're stuck with those rules as well. So we want to achieve opt-in. That's the goal. People must be out by default. But this effect, use SAMUS, is constantly sucking everyone in. So the question is, how do we fight this effect? Now, here's Peter Todd's point. He is saying here, a sidechain that has been soft forked in is no longer a sidechain. It's a block size increase, just like SegWit. He's 100% correct if he's talking about a mandatory sidechain, which I know that he is, because the preceding two, if not, then Peter Todd is, I think, uh, completely mistaken. But I don't think that he is mistaken. I think he's just talking about a mandatory sidechain. I think that's what he means by when he says soft forked in, although we are in danger, again, of committing Greg, Greg Slepak's, um, uh, excuse me, Greg Slepak's uh, error here, which is to say that we're not doing anything to prevent the miners from taking the coins. Um, but I think it's just, I think Peter Todd's meaning is clear here, he, because the preceding tweet says, the problem with mind sidechains is that the segwit anyone can spend issue is a reality, not fear, uncertainty, doubt, and miners can steal sidechain funds. The reason why segwit doesn't have that problem, the problem of funds being stolen, is because full notes prevent the theft, but sidechains have only minor trusting SBV. And so Peter Todd's concern is about the sidechain being mandatory because like uh, SegWit, it um, is a de facto block size increase. And I'm going to get to that in a few slides. So so first, we're, I just want to bring this up here that, uh, oh, I think I said this already, but the point is that Peter Todd's point would be even be true for very exotic things like uh, ZK snarks or coin witness type things. If they're, uh, we, we would hope, I think, that they would be not optional. But, but if the fact that they would not be optional, the fact that we'd sort of soft fork them in, so to speak, or, or put them in on the user's nodes, um, that would, uh, by making it not optional, it would be a sort of evil fork. I'm going to explain that more. Unfortunately, a lot of issues are tangled up here, but the point is that we would hope there would be an irrelevant evil fork because coin witness is uh, something that's pretty cool and we wouldn't mind doing it. I think this will become clearer as after we get to the eighth slide. So just maybe listen to the whole thing and then watch it twice and see, and see how you do. Now, the thing is, as I said, the eighth slide is a, is a contradiction or a mutually exclusive criteria situation. So a second thing that we have to think about here is uh, the idea of stealing Bitcoin. And both of these uh, gentlemen have a tweet thread that starts the same way. Uh, this guy, Marcel, um, he, uh, yeah, fortunately, what a lot of these people will do is, to their credit, they will admit that they, uh, that they didn't read anything and they have no idea what they're talking about. But... The green thing down there is great. It's true. The, for his first sentence in that lower bottom tweet is excellent, and we will re be returning to it. It's very important. And that the part in red is false. But let me just start it off for you. He says, Drive Chain Security, he's quoting me, this model allows a 51% minor coalition to actually steal Bitcoins. Again, this is abusing what I have said for the sake of clarity uh, and misrepresenting it as a bad thing when it's actually a good thing. I will explain that very soon. I say it's a very dishonest summary, and then we ask why. This is Greg Slepak over here. Uh, as I already mentioned, he thinks that we're doing nothing at all to prevent miners from stealing drive chain funds, but that's not true. But Greg says, what's preventing them from withdrawing the entire balance? Luke says, nothing stops that with the big block there, miners in control model. Even though Luke does understand drive chain, I think he he and I have the same struggle here where you have to explain that the way this security works is different. Um, so he's using the word nothing, I think, a little loosely there. But he says immediately afterwards, correctly, that at least with drive chains, however, withdrawal is slow and can be blocked. We're going to talk a lot about that because it's totally misunderstood. There's going to be lots of tweets quoted about that very soon. And then Greg asks why. He's like, this sounds like it's some kind of hocus pocus. 
uh, which I guess it does because so many people don't understand it. But it looks it correctly answers that well. It can only occur in supermajority of users when my ex excuse me when a supermajority of miners are participating in the attack. Blocking it would be a UASF. Perfect answer from Luke. Then Greg says, "Okay, drive chains are officially dumb." Uh, he says the drive chain security model is a complete regression back to banking, which is a point of view you could hold if you wanted to be quoted like that in a video. You can so. The issue that all this is building to is that they're actually those gray lines inside that graphic over there. They are just kind of a little doodle, a little sketch of what I think is possible in the design space of sidechains. And I, what the point of them is that, well, you can scribble down. You can obviously make something arbitrarily mandatory or arbitrarily insecure. You can scribble down there. Um, and you can try to make something that's both optional and secure, but the point is this red dot in the bottom right, which is to say that the only way that you can make something 100% secure is if it's mandatorily, is, is enforced by all the full nodes of Bitcoin. So there's a blue region of perfect security that would make these two people, Marcel and Slepak, happy, the people on the previous slide. But I think the only thing in that region that is achievable is the, the red dot. So I think the only way to make it 100% secure where minor theft is impossible, as I say on that line, is to make it 100% mandatory, at which point is 0% optional, because then the full nodes are trumping the miners 100% of the time. But we, we don't actually want that, though, because... You can see at the top I have zone 1 and zone 2 at the top of the little graphic there. And in zone 1, the smart people are happy, but in zone 2, the people who admit that they have no idea what they're talking about, or, are, or obviously have no idea what they're talking about, they are happy. And there's a kind of black and white fetish for 100% security that is uh, very misguided. In fact, I think it's revealing that Greg Maxwell proved that Bitcoin was impossible using math just months uh, before reality unproved that by making it actually work. And I think that there is a kind of weird obsession with 100% security that is completely false because such a thing does not really exist. And I'm not even sure how it would be defined. But in this context, you would define it as saying the full nodes enforce all the rules because that would mean that the miners can never do pull anything on you at all because the node will always block it. But as I just explained, if you do that, I think it would be a 100. It would have to be 100% mandatory, and this is where it is. It starts to get a little wearing because people will constantly misunderstand this nuance of the argument and they will uh, attack sort of attack you from both sides on this which is um, very disappointing but in the zone one we want everything to be we want that pink region we want everything to be 100 percent optional and what you can do is you can say well it's optional and then we'll make it as secure as we possibly can we can try to hit 99.999 percent secure and we can make it so the only people who are harmed by insecurity the people who choose to take that informed risk. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that. First, though, I want to draw your attention to this blue region. Where, so Peter Todd and Luke Jr., they want minor theft to be possible because main chain users must be able to ignore the side chain. Okay, main chain users must believe that the main miners will not change the main chain as a result of what happens on the side chain. So that's essential because you want it to be totally opt-in. You want it to be totally ignorable side chains. But Marcel and Slepik, they want minor theft to be completely impossible. And that's why this sentence from Marcel is perfect, actually. He says it's my explanation in the, the, the tweet that precedes that is where I give him my, I link him to my post explaining why I don't think it's likely that miners will be able to steal any money ever. And he says that that is an explanation of likeliness, not possibility. He wants it to be 100% impossible. 99% isn't good enough for him. But as I have been trying to explain this whole time, you cannot actually achieve both. The only way to make it 
uh, minor proof is to put it 100% on the nodes. So I don't know how many times I'm going to have to repeat that point before people get it, but I'm guessing it's a lot more. It's interesting to note that Greg Slapback over here on the right, that was back in June, he thought about it for like uh, many months, because this is in October, and then he wrote a post that I think everyone should read because of how ridiculous it is and how these the, the critics of Drive Chain have like the least informed people um, I think in any Bitcoin technical debate, it's it's very shocking. But you should read his thing, Generalized Sharding Protocol for Decentralized Scaling Without Miners Owning our BTC, because of just how bad it is. It's just laughably bad. Uh, awkward crickets in the room, like no one really knew what to say. But this guy right here, Lucas Clemente Vela, uh, he, I don't, I have no idea who he is, um, but he said the correct thing to Greg, which is what he said was, if you have to change Bitcoin to recognize a transfer from the side chain back into Bitcoin, what he, what he calls Bitcoin is what I call the main chain. He says, so side, from side chain to main chain, you kill the purpose of the side chain. You could as well just change the Bitcoin, the main chain, to implement whatever desirable features a side chain would have. The whole idea of side chains is to keep Bitcoin unchanged and allow for the voluntary transfer of tokens out of Bitcoin to the side chain of your choosing. 100% correct. See, that's what I'm talking about. You don't want to do that as exact this person is completely agreeing with me and with peter todd when they say that if you have nodes enforcing the rules it is no longer a side chain it's just a, a mandatory um block size increase or or mandatory extension block which is the same thing so now we revisit this tweet because i think it can help us learn things um, so we have drive chain secure this model. He's quoting me, but I could have instead said something else. I could have said drive chain security. This model allows the side chain to be optional, thus protecting main chain users from being kept in the dark about the status of their main chain payments. So hopefully that's more clear for you. Now, there is something called Forcenet, which is a mandatory side chain plus a 51% censorship attack that was written by Dr. Johnson Lau as part of the hard fork research that people uh, have been doing, which is nice because it is um, the sort of the negative mirror image of DriveChain where it Forcenet does force full nodes to validate all sidechain rules. And this prevents theft. There's no theft possible, but that's at the cost of forcing all the main chain users to upgrade, which is exactly the, the thing we don't like about the hard fork because it allows arbitrary changes and it's for similar reasons we don't like the evil fork which is a so-called soft hard fork if you don't know what that is you really should not be commenting on drive chain at all because one of the main benefits of drive chain is that it preemptively forestalls these evil forks so if you don't even know what they are then you just don't know what you're talking about but um, one example of an evil fork or a soft hard fork as Peter Todd uh, alluded to in his tweet, is uh, SegWit itse itself. In fact, I believe that um, when it was first pitched by Luke Jr., um, he said that it was uh, basically an extension block filled with signatures. Someone should go back into Bitcoin Wizards and look that up, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that that's what he said it was. He said it was an extension block filled with signatures, and he would be correct, of course. Um, and exactly because the users affect miners affect users affect... Um, SegWit is an extension block or an evil fork, as I said, and it's not 100% opt-in. It's highly opt-in, but it's not 100% opt-in. And that is exactly why it is secure, which is what Peter Todd was saying on his tweet. So it's because it's enforced and because the miners will eventually not be able to advance the chain that has invalid SegWit stuff. That is why your SegWit transactions are safe it's because they're mandatory. So I don't know, maybe people will still not understand that, but Dr. Back understood all this. Uh, he figured a lot of it out in 2014. He almost fixed the entire block size debate. That would have been really nice if only he could have done that, but he didn't quite get close enough, but he got very close. And he is talking about extension blocks, which are pretty awesome, but they're not as awesome as side chains. As I explained, they have a flaw, which made them... Uh, unusable. Although, of course, we can never actually tell if miners secretly have installed a bunch of mandatory extension blocks that they just didn't tell us about, which is an interesting 
conundrum. But the point is that we have this optional secure trade-off over there on the left, the top left. And what Dr. Beck did is he made the extension blocks very secure because like all the cryptographers, he's obsessed with security. And then he, oh, I'm sorry, I think um, I forgot to explain this, but yes, the uh, those arrows are some examples of trade-offs along the optional secure item there. So the, tw the, the holiest of holy, the 21 million coin limit, is down there at the, the most secure part and the least optional part. And then a soft fork is up at the top left there. There's a soft fork that we haven't activated yet. So obviously it's 100% optional, very insecure. So that's just kind of what I was trying to do was give a flavor about that. Sorry for not explaining that on the previous slide, but hopefully it made sense. So anyways, what, what Dr. Beck did with this red line is he, he focused on security first, and then he tried to make it optional. But in practice, he created some sort of a permanent second-class citizen, as I call it here. But you should read all this stuff because he's repeating a lot of the stuff that I've been saying over and over again about use. This first thing uh, in the lower section here, um, let me see if this works. Oh, here it is. So you, this lower section here, you can read where he says, here lies the risk. This imposes a security downgrade on the one megabyte non-upgraded users and also users who upgrade but aren't really upgrading. So that's the USAMIS thing because you don't know whether or not your payments are payments to you are going through or not. So the mandatory extension block requires you to know. But this you should read all this in like my, my little comments, but it's just very neat that how much of this was figured out. Now I need to draw I have the red arrow there because drive chain does it the other way. It goes up first and then across. So that is the difference. Here's Adam back in 2017. Thank you Adam back for your um help on tying these crazy knots that people get confused over. Um, so he says that I think people more prefer the drive chain approach, uh, the code not directly expanding consensus code, nor as directly increasing the required data to validate the main chain, correctly placing the emphasis on what people are required to do. Very correct. So, but there won't be nothing. There will be, so at this pink box up here, drive chain mandatory trivialities for miners. This is the Greg Slapback's mistake, which he thinks that nothing is stopping the miners from stealing the money. But this train metaphor that is coming that is what stops that from happening. Now for users, everything's optional. Uh, even upgrading your Bitcoin node, you know, is optional because it's a soft fork. So you don't, even, or you could just comment out the drive chain part. So it's fully 100% optional. And as you can see, that's the evolution of drive chain is this black arrow. First upwards, emphasizing opt-in, and then we do whatever we can to make security as much as possible, knowing that we cannot reach 100% without leading to a contradiction, the epistemic contradiction. So this is um, Chris Stewart. And I like Chris Stewart a lot, but he is wrong about this. And he, for some reason, Ah, constantly saying this, even though it's not right. So um, he's saying that there's something else called sidechain headers on main chain, which is isomorphic to drive chains. But it's not true. It's actually isomorphic to extension blocks um, because ex because of the USAMIS effect. The extension block in as shown here is very likely to end up being mandatory, or there's very there's no clear way of placing the blame on the people who did something wrong, thus discrediting them and stopping them from affecting other people. Whereas in drive chain, the damage really is, it's all known up front and it's all transparent and it's all contained in the side chain itself. So it actually is different, but Shom over there is um, similar to um, extension blocks and that's, the extension blocks are old and people didn't like uh, them because well, you know, let me go back and just read it a little bit. So this lower part right here is Adam Beck's crusade. The lower left part is his, him trying to make the sidechain optional. And he says, we could defend non-upgrade users by making the receive funds, that comes, the funds that came out of the extension block, opt-in also. He says, a new address version. Construct the extension blocks so that payments out of it can only go to the new version addresses. So you see what he's really done is he's made a one-way street. Um, and it's unclear, you know, whether or not people will, will ever want to go into the extension block knowing that they can't come back out ever 
or that they can't put that risk on someone else. So he's uh, Adam Back was further than Shom in 2015 when he wrote this post because uh, he knew that you couldn't just have an unclear criterion for what would happen if something came out of a extension block, which is the problem with this. Now, as I said, you get misunderstood from both sides here. Um, you get misunderstood on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, and both people assume the worst. And I don't know what to do about that other than try to explain that contradiction more, even though I think, you know, the smart people like Peter Todd and Adam Back and Luke Jr., they do know it, but these other people in the audience, just they do not know what they're talking about, unfortunately. And, you know, you could put some of that blame on me because I guess I didn't explain it very well, but I don't know, I'm explaining it now. So here is this guy, uh, this alpaca southwest. The meaningful downside is I now have to pay attention to and validate something I never cared to. Now, hopefully you see that this isn't true. The entire point of everything done in a go any good sidechain project, but definitely in drive chain, is to make this so that he does not have to pay attention to anything ever. So that's 100% false. So I would prefer it if people would delete this concept from their minds because it is 100% false. The trains thing is enforced on miners, but that's not. Um, you don't have to, to, what you have to pay attention and validate is just regular main chain Bitcoin messages. So it's nothing from the side chain at all, zero. Uh, so this guy, anyway, Al prefers it to be optional, even though it already is. So problem solved. It's simply false. But uh, obviously Giacomo Zucco liked it. A good idea, uh, a good rule of thumb is if Giacomo Zucco likes the tweet and it's side chain related, it's probably the opposite of true. So that's a good rule of thumb to so just keep an eye out for that. Now here is the other the other edge of it, the security part, where he says, I'm not a fan of any changes that gives miners more power. So Mr. Hoddle here prefers that it be mandatory. But the only way it can be mandatory is if it's secured by the main chain full nodes. And the only way they can do that is if they uh, are validating the entire side chain, which defeats the entire point and would make Peter Todd and Luke Dash Jr. very upset. So I'm not sure if Mr. Hoddle, I think he does not know, but my question here is that does he know that he disagrees with Peter Todd and Luke Des Jr., as well as this guy over here, who says he doesn't want to care about, with considerable justification, says that he doesn't want to care about with these stupid sidechain projects. So I don't think he realizes that he disagrees with them. And his argument would disqualify all sidechain designs, because as I explained in the coin witness part, you would, um, you would, uh, the, the only, the whole point of a sidechain is that it's optional. That's the entire point. So what he's saying is he just wants, he doesn't want to put anything, he wants to put everything on the full nodes. For him, it's full nodes or bust. Now that's fine for him, uh, but all that really means is that he doesn't have to, he shouldn't be running or depositing any money into any sidechain. So he shouldn't be a user of sidechains, but he should not decide for other people. Um, so uh, he could just as easily have said and there's a very, very real sense in which he is saying that he's just not a fan of sidechains when he says that he's not a fan of any changes that give miners more power. It's, it's, first of all, it's false that it gives miners more power. That is not uh, true. And I touched on that a little bit earlier, and I, I'm going to be talking about it much more, I think. But um, the only translation of this into anything that does make any sense is for him to just say that he's not a fan of sidechains at all. Um, okay. So here is Giacomo Zucco uh, saying some crazy stuff, uh, falsely accusing me of talking about conspiracy theories, which I will get to at the very end of this. Uh, and the second point, changes to mainnet that raise concerns will not happen until addressed. I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I've replied to every single uh, person who has written to me with any concern, with, with a tremendous depth. And I don't, I'm not aware of a single person who whose concern has not been responded to, even the people who uh, obviously had no idea what they were talking about whatsoever. But this first thing is that he has a very bizarre concern about giving ASIC monopolists more political influence. So he believes that the miners control the fate of Bitcoin, which is interesting. 
because most people don't believe that. Um, he thinks that mining is a political thing, and which is also interesting because it's it's not really political at all. It's just whoever um, can do more hashes in a given unit of time stays alive and everyone else dies. So that's very interesting that he thinks that. But basically, um, there are two models for explaining <coughs> uh, the way miners behave. The one on the left is, excuse me, the one on the left is Giacomo's model, where he's saying the miners will do whatever they can to become more politically influential. And the model on the right is the correct model, which says that the miners will do whatever is more profitable. And the reason that that is correct is because of the way Bitcoin works, which is that it will fire the bottom, it will, the, the, the lower 50% of miners ranked in terms of profitability, that group, uh, the underperforming group, is fired every two weeks. So that is tremendously um, motivating threat and very scary. So they must be, it doesn't matter. So this is another thing, people talk about um, ASIC boost or other things like that. Uh, that's ASIC boost cannot really have an effect on anything because if ASIC boost is if ASIC boost is um, very effective, what will eventually happen is that all the people who don't use ASIC boost will be pushed out, and then they will be no longer mining, and they won't be miners anymore, and then everyone in the mining game will use ASIC boost. And at that point, there's no difference between a soft fork that disables it and one that does not, because if it disables it, then it disables it for literally everyone in the entire mining ecosystem. So that would just mean that there would be a weird two weeks, certainly, but after that, the difficulty would just fall by whatever the improvement factor was. And so it's a total it's a total wash. Miners are only motivated by profit, in my opinion. But people do bring up an interesting question, which is, oh, if miners are motivated by profit and SegWit is good and it was an opt-in soft fork, although it wasn't really because of that block size increase part, it was a, that block size increase part was an evil fork, but the rest of it was... A regular soft fork that was opt-in. So people say, why did the miners blockade SegWit? Which is a very uh, long and interesting story that I would love to tell in uh, a lot of detail, but it's uh, one reason is that scaling three was too little uh, too late. And what I mean by that is there are these, for many years ago, when the scalability debates began, like in 2012 or something like that, 2013, Peter Todd made that video, uh, Keep Bitcoin Free. So the community was already fracturing into two different groups, and the groups were getting slowly further and further and further apart. And then they reached the breaking point with Bitcoin XT in 2015. People said, well, you know, let's just, we'll figure this out at scaling one. And so let's just wait to scaling one. And that's what, you know, this is complex stuff. We'll figure it out. So that's what people did. Then at scaling one, it was decided, okay, let's wait for scaling two, which is only in three months. And then at scaling two, it was decided, okay, segregated witness is the plan, and it will be done by April 1st. April 1st, 2016. Now you have to put, remember what was happening in 2016. That was when all this, this ICO stuff was starting. Ethereum was really getting really big. And so I have an explanation for why SegWit was withheld that is consistent with the profit motive uh, model of miner decisions, which is that in 2016, the miners were earnestly confused about what would maximize the value of their mining equipment. And they thought, let's see, I have this on this next slide. Miners, in their mind, they thought that if they withheld SegWit, they could increase the likelihood of a block size increase I mean, that part's clear. But the second part, the second link, second arrow, that they would increase the likelihood of a block size increase, that that would lead them to get more money, that part is, of course, uh, very unclear. But I think that's what miners believed, or they were at least willing to give it a try, or at least come in for two megabytes. Uh, and I think they were earnestly confused. I don't think they wanted more power. I just think they wanted more money. And they thought, 2016, they were seeing uh, all these altcoins uh, take off, 
and they were hearing complaints about fees and uh, you know this the, all these people will have there's a lot of stuff at like BitPay and Coinbase where tons of people call customer support and there are people who they have no idea how Bitcoin works and they're confused and their money's in limbo and they're very upset. I think one thing that people should do if they if you if you're skeptical of my view that the miners were were confused about what to do and that this was just they earnestly believed that the block size increase would lead them to make more money. I think you should look up the video of the miner roundtable or the miner panel or whatever it was called in Scaling Hong Kong, Scaling 2. You can find it online. And it's it's very interesting to me. I think it's very clear that the miners, you know, they have a very different understanding of the technology, which is to say uh, it's very limited. And I don't think they really understand it very much at all. And so they didn't really, I think they really didn't know. Uh, they were angry at being asked by Mike Curran and Gavin to like choose a side. They were like, we don't want to pick a side. You know, why are you making us pick a side? Then everyone gets angry at us. This is what the miners were saying. So I think they really just, everything the miners have ever done is consistent with uh, a profit motive model. And really nothing is consistent. I mean, there's not even an explanation for how they would be rewarded for having more power, even though they're, they're so clearly and so strongly rewarded for being more profitable. Uh, so I don't know the what the explanation is for this. Um, but his concern about uh, people getting more political influence, the real reason, oh, let me let me go back, actually. the He's concerned about, what motivates his concern is the blockade of SegWit. But as I mentioned, the problem with SegWit was scaling three. That was when, um, that was literally when miners decided to start running Bitcoin Unlimited and to blockade SegWit. Because it was at that time, not April, it was in October, that they shipped SegWit. Many of the miners were so upset uh, from Scaling 3 that they left immediately, much uh, long before the presentation, the, any of the talks were over, even in some cases before day one was over. Uh, people left uh, the conference um, angrily to go back and blockade SegWit because they believed that if they withheld SegWit, they could, they could persuade uh, they could just do something to make the block size increase more likely. Now, you can argue about whether or not they were wrong, but this is clearly what they believed. And I know that that's what they believed because the Monday after Scaling 3, many of us who, who noticed the problems and the dissatisfaction gathered in a, a circle outside the building. And we talked about this. And there was a miner there. And they were going to, Pindar Wong was going to redo Scaling 3. He was going to do it at... Um, the cyber port again, like, and he literally asks, uh, do they want it uh, three months from now or four months from now? And I said, well, I think they were expecting it, you know, today. So probably at least three months. And there was a, a miner there who nodded very enthusiastically when I said that. And he, in a way that was like, finally, someone understands me. I don't really want to put people on the spot, but there were a lot of big names in the circle who realized that something was was wrong and amiss and that is the real story behind oh the other thing is no one believed me when i said well they they went back and they're going to block segwit people thought why would they do that so i'm the only one like around here i think that actually understands what what's going on with this this bib 9 like comment that he's making over here but what i realized while i was making this slide is that it's actually not a use Samus comment at all because only the speculators are affected because his convoluted argument is that um, miners will threaten to steal from a side chain unless something happens. Uh, and I really don't think that I have another slide in the future about that, which hopefully we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to. But uh, so I don't believe him. But even if that were the case, we just have to say, well, okay, you can steal from the side chain because only the speculators are affected, and this is the risk that they took. And this is just the one, the, an argument in disguise, one that exists already, which is, but the side chain users might lose the gamble. Well, that's what happens when you gamble. Sometimes you lose. And I, let me repeat: the gamble is that I'm wrong about a minor strategy being objectively the most profitable, which I very well, I may be wrong. I'm not saying I'm. It's a hundred percent thing. But I definitely think this is the best sidechain design of all the optional sidechain designs. 
in existence. Uh, and I'm certainly saying that it's totally misunderstood by almost everyone, which is except for Adam Back and Luke Jr. and like three other people, which is shocking, shockingly mis misunderstood. Um, so that's the risk that they take, and this it's, it's really just a recast of of that argument uh, into something else. So that is that is a large sort of central section about the opt-in question. But now we are going to return. The presentation is back on track. And you have to remember, remember back, oh, you can see it in the bottom right here. There are these um, these three criteria. And we're, we're very close. And we only need this one thing left. So we're going to talk about what's the best way of getting it. I'm going to walk you through my reasoning. Hopefully you understand it better when I walk you through it. Maybe you won't. I don't know. Maybe no one will watch this video. I have no idea. But let's think about some things here. The top left blue box is going to teach us some important things. The second thing is that pink part that I've already talked about, which is that the main chain cannot enforce the side chain's rules. It has no idea what they are or who's following them or what's going on over there. It doesn't know anything. We have that veil there. Now, the upper one is even easier to understand, if you can believe it. That's a quote from ing.bitcoin.it protocol documentation, but you don't have to worry because it's an uncontroversial fact. Um, the fact is that in a transaction, the sum of all inputs must be equal to or greater than the sum of all outputs. So basically, you can't counterfeit money with transactions. The main chain rules already present, prevent that. So now I want you to consider the Roman numerals there, 1 and 2, in that, in that middle box. And you see one of them is a payment from B to E and F, and the other one is a payment from B to H. Now, if B only puts seven Bitcoin into the side chain, and that's the only thing that happens, because that's the only thing I've shown, then you can't like spend eight Bitcoin out, because the main chain will already reject that. So the what's interesting is the main chain is for free, completely for free, but very fortunately, the main chain's already doing our accounting for the side chains, the same way it does the accounting for literally everyone every Bitcoin transaction. So that's nice. That's very fortunate. Um, but so the main chain rule is already preventing counterfeiting and can, can never enforce the sidechain's rules. So theft notwithstanding, sidechain theft, which is that, that pink thing again, those two pink rectangles that are mutually exclusive in different timelines or different possibilities. Theft notwithstanding, a peg has already achieved itself of a kind, because seven Bitcoin go in and seven will eventually come out, or in the theft case, at least all of them would probably come out. So our unsolved problem is actually not uh, a pegged transaction. It's actually theft. So we really need to solve theft. And what I suggest is that the way to do it is to exploit all these things that are and not true of the atomic cross-chain swaps. So we will have like a puzzle. You see, we have the atomic cross-chain swaps will get one half of the territory, and then our new thing will be the negative part of that territory, and they will fit together perfectly. Now, what are the advantages of the atomic cross-chain swaps? Well, they're very fast. Even without the Lightning Network, they are atomic, and so you have reliability that they will confirm. In the next block that they can confirm, they will confirm. Um, and they're easy to use, and they're, they're and they theft is impossible there. So that's that's basically it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do basically the opposite of that. We're going to have long, slow, transparent, vulnerable withdrawals. The other thing is the atomic cross chain swaps are are not transparent. So our thing will be transparent. Atomic cross chain swaps are fast, so our thing will be slow. Slow, and by slow I mean slow, like three months. Because what we're doing here is we're moving, let me use the pointer, we're moving to the right there. Remember, we're doing what we can for security. It's so important. Let me go back to it. Here it is. Oh, wait. Wrong direction. Sorry. Oh, actually, I had it on a different slide. This is very funny. Okay, here's what we're doing here. We're moving in this part. We're moving to the right. We made it as optional as we could. Now we're making it more secure, as I said before. Wow, that's weird. Okay, good. So... The thing is slow, but we're going to get speed elsewhere because the main decide deposits use embedded consensus. So they are uh, immediate. They are immediate. And as soon as it's included in one block chain, it's included in the other one by definition. And the main decide, side to main, those, those trades are swaps. So you, they are, everything starts on the main chain. It can go to the side chain immediately, and you can swap 
main and side uh, immediately. So we have lots of speed, and you can also do Lightning Network across different chains, but you just have to have people with channels open in all the relevant chains in order to do that. But I think people will end up doing that. But the point is, speed is coming from speed is growing on trees here. We got lots of speed, so users should not be using these slow withdrawals. It's kind of like taking a contract to court where you almost never have to do that, only if something goes wrong. So now here's my train metaphor that will hopefully explain a lot of things to people. Um, so hopefully you enjoy this part. The, we, since the withdrawals are slow, we're definitely going to batch them. So what's, what it's like is that all these people on the train platform are individual transactions that are trying to go take Bitcoin from the side chain to the main chain and they're all of them are going to get on a big train and the train's going to go and everyone's going to go together so uh, this is an old graphic that I used I only bring it up to point out that uh, here's something called what I call a WT a withdrawal transaction and they're all assembled into this WT carrot and um, and then it then they, they go off across as a group is all I'm trying to say so now we're going to talk about the security model um, as I explained, we aimed for being totally optional, 100% ignorable stuff at first, and we are going to make it more secure. In practice, I've intentionally curved this line because by when we make it more secure, we'll actually also be making it more optional because the, the slowness prevents anyone from trying to, it, it strongly prevents the USAMUS uh, effect because um, the users are much less likely to, to be susceptible to uh, a kind of persuasion. I'm not sure I'm going to articulate this point very well, but the point is it becomes more optional because these things are, it's much easier for everyone to say, well, you, you knew what you were getting into, and this entire thing happened with 100% transparency. That's in contrast to extension blocks and, and with other things that we don't have time to explain. The security model, I mean, one second. Oh, this is taking longer than I thought, but uh, I think it's important, and I don't know. I don't really care at this point. You know, this is just, it needs to be said. So the security model is very similar to Satoshi Nakamoto's security model for Bitcoin. This is here. I have his announcement written here, and um, I say that he, sa he says somewhere that it takes advantage of the nature of information being easy to spread but hard to stifle, and then I say in my FAQ below, that drive chain condenses the from extension to original messages into infrequent, easy to validate, unambiguous chain scale messages. You have to read the FAQ to learn more about what I mean about that. But but the point I'm trying to make on this slide is that Satoshi's claim about information being easy to spread but hard to stifle, that is only true because of proof of work, because uh, it's very easy to stifle the spread of information by just spreading multiple different contradictory informations. If I say Dr. Adam Back's password is, you know, goldfish. I can then say that it's every other word in the dictionary, and then we'll have destroyed the information, which is the point of the Library of Babel. Um, but with proof of work, we flip that around, and we say, oh, information is easy to spread, but hard to stifle. And so, in the security model for drive chain, is aims to replicate this with information being very difficult to generate but easy to verify. Um, that is, so it's kind of like a giant cryptographic hash function in a sense. So I encourage you to read the FAQ because it's great. Some people will complain that it's too long, and then they'll complain that I haven't addressed all the uh, criticisms of the project without even reading the FAQ. So I don't know. You can, I think it says a lot, you know, about an individual's character, what kind of bizarre things they say on Twitter. But there you are. Okay, remember our example. So here's the train thing. Is here's the train thing. So this will hopefully make everything super clear. I hope it will. If not, you should just give up on understanding drive chain and go back to something else. But I think this explanation is pretty clear. So we have our example here, and then you can see B. Remember going to E F, B going to H. I've been repeating it many times, so hopefully you know it. The second history. This one is the false one. H doesn't actually own any money on this side chain. He's stealing the money. But the side chain, excuse me, the main chain, it has no idea whether or not H is telling the truth and E and F are lying or whether or not E and F are telling the truth and H is lying. It can't know. 
because the sidechain has to be optional. That was the point of the pink part. So now, as I said, all these people are going to get on a little train. So here's E and F. E is that guy holding a little work bag, and F is this uh, woman who also has a bag and a purse, and she's wearing like a purple little coat. And they're E and F, and they're going to get on the train, and I'm calling this train Train 1. Train 1 is the train that takes money from B and gives it to E and F. Okay? Ready? Now pay attention, because we're going to go to Train 2. Train 2 takes money from B to H. The problem is there is no H. H is a fake person. See, they're represented there by a fake icon standing with real people. This H output isn't real. It's not on the side chain. It's fake. And just for fun, i got two more examples. So here's train three. It says Z and K, both fake. And then train four, also fake. Uh, this is a woman, X. Now, I've represented all these trains here on this grid for you. E, F, H, Z, K, and X. The woman is X, remember? X chromosome. Uh, and so now I've started this off at time equals 9, and we're going to run it to time equals 16. And hopefully you understand what I mean when I say that per sidechain, this is all this entire thing, all of these are for one sidechain. So I've just labeled it sidechain number six to just point out that it's an arbitrary sidechain. Now per sidechain, only one train car can advance at a time. The others move back. And I think this is something that people don't really get. It's one of two important things that people don't get. So I've got a little video here. It's not really a video, but it's a slideshow, and it's going to go from time equals 9 to time equals 16. So watch very carefully. In particular, watch this guy right here. Put your eye on right on this ZK. These, these cylinders are all trains, by the way. And by only one train car advancing at a time, I mean each main block, so each every 10 minutes in expectation. So watch, watch the ZK train. Here it is. Okay, so here it goes up. There it goes forward. You see it went forward. Now I'm going to go back a slide to time equals 9, and then I'm going to play the video, and then I'm going to explain it. So here I'm going to play the whole video. I'm going to go back to time equals 9, the starting point. Now watch, look in this region, and I'm going to go to time equals 16, and then I'm going to explain it. Okay, here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, that was the video. Now I'm going to explain what's going on here. When one train car advances, the others move back. And as you can see, in this time it goes 11, EF is now advanced. CK has moved back. And now it's happened again. Now you can abstain. Miners can choose not to do it because they can freely ignore uh, the sidechain withdrawals even. So not only do they have to ignore the entire sidechain, but they can say, look, I don't know what's going on here, but I will not acknowledge. So miner will choose one of these four, or none of them is what I'm saying. So this part is a new ability granted to miners. Well, as I explained, it's a new thing that users can choose to allow miners to do with their money and no one else's, which is subjected to the, this process. But I and others believe that the process is, is pretty reliable. Um, it certainly would not be correct to say that this grants miners more power than they already have but for reasons that I will explain at the end when I do the two comparisons. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy that part. But now, as I was saying here, is the miners will pick one of these to advance each time. And they can just choose to do nothing. And another interesting thing they can choose is to do what I call the alarm. And with the alarm, all the trains move back. So you say something fishy is going on, and you alarm. And you do this once per block per main chain block, and then this thing moves forward. Now, once a train car advances 13,150 places, which is one quarter of a year, three months, it crosses the finish line, and then the passengers can disembark, which is to say the transactions in the train can be included in the main chain block. And the Bitcoin has moved from side chain to main chain, finally, which is what we were trying to do. Now, the trains expire, so to speak, Either when they cross the finish line and when their transactions are included, they expire immediately. But if otherwise, they expire after six months, 26,300 blocks. Now, as you can see in the little rectangle in the bottom left, I say this info in green, the fact that one, e, that EF is being promoted over H, 
and this is just 32 byte hashes. They're very small. So it's not, there's no data payload here yet. It's just one 32 byte hash. So this info is now costly to make, but it's easy to verify. We'll see that on the next slide, but it's similar to proof of work in this way. And this is de facto SPV proof. In fact, it's the best so far that I'm aware of by many, uh, and you should read the FAQ if you want to learn about why, comparing it to other SPV proofs. This talk is already too long. I'm definitely skipping the blind merge mining section. Meanwhile, the correct withdrawal, okay, so the side chain should make it very easy to learn which withdrawal is correct. Now, I there's nothing I can do as a designer of drive chain to make sure that that happens because the side chain has infinite degrees of freedom and people are free to make any weird mistakes they want over there. But it should be very easy to, in, in practice, make this happen. So one thing is do, by including the 32-byte hash, which is this information here about E and F being the right answer, so just include that in every single sidechain header for six months or until it's confirmed. Remember, because of the counterparty thing, because it's asymmetric, it will know as soon as it's succeeded, and it will be able to remove it then. So you include it in every single sidechain header, or you just put it in the left node of some kind of compound Merkle tree or something like that, which is almost the same thing. So the point is, it's just really, really easy to find this. Now remember, the main, but see, the, the main chain has no idea which withdrawals are side valid. That's the pink thing. So it doesn't know all of these headers could be invalid. They could just be totally fabricated headers. But you can just look at them and see, well, you know, okay, either 99% of the headers say EF is right and only one or two don't say that. Or if there's some scenario of confusion, they can just use the alarm as a, that's point number four here. So if, if anything's confusing at all, they can just say, well, we, we're confused about this and we'll delay. And regular users should not be using this process. And in fact, I, my guess is that only the miners will end up actually walking the coins back from the side chain to the main chain because they have total control over that process. So uh, that would be a weird, uh, that's, well, that's a lot of things to consider. And I mentioned that in the November 2015 uh, security model, which of course no one has read, even though it's been, it's uh, two and a half years. So I don't know what to say about that, but this is the updated model, and I'm saying it's still true. So you can, uh, so right, so here's the thing. Is even if you run the sidechain in SPV mode, examine the withdrawals there for stability and consistency, you still have other things you can do, which is to say you've got, you've got three months to, to be warned about this from your, from your friends who run the sidechain or from um, social media or anything like that. Now, a lot of people are going to say that this is flaky, and they are correct because the only way to make it not flaky is to force the full nodes, the main chain full nodes, to validate everything, which is exactly what we don't want. So it's kind of annoying. As I said, this is misunderstood from both directions. People will look at this and say, wow, we're really relying on what someone says on Twitter for the, to the block hash. But I, I think they really just don't appreciate what's going on here. So you're just checking to see if one 32-byte hash matches another 32-byte hash. You only have to do that once every three months. So um, I guess it, it that's and it's not even a requirement. It's optional. This is the, we're trying to make it more secure part. So what we're trying to say is that money cannot be stolen from the side chain unless the miners intend to just basically shut off the entire side chain's project permanently. Um, which uh, in which case it. Uh, it would have never worked anyway. So it's possible that side chains are themselves a bad idea, but what we're trying to do here is force the miners to totally 100% own the decision. Um, okay, so yes. And as I explained, the, even the miners don't 100% own this. They don't anyway, because the miners have to wait 100 blocks for the coins they mine to even be sold. So they need Miners need to be thinking about what they can sell these coins for uh, at all times. And that is, I think, three or four slides from now. But right now, we're going to talk about the UASF because it's also totally misunderstood in this uh, model here. So if users detect a bad withdrawal, which they will immediately because the sidechain node will notice because it's asymmetric. So the sidechain node will know immediately and it can like throw a giant alarm and do all these crazy things, start flashing. If main chain users detect a bad withdrawal, so this is the, the few users who maybe run both or can be persuaded by their sidechain running friends, 
they can choose to reject any block that includes the bad withdrawal. So basically, the train arrives, but the doors don't open. And you, this, what I have this graphically represented up here, and two, the bad case, there's a scope, and you blow up the end of the train, or you just don't let the train um, open when it finally gets 13,000 confirmations three months later. So um, I'm going to go over the timeline in a couple slides, but it's three months after you notice the theft that you can block it for free, basically. And I'm going to explain that on later slides. So we have plans to make this, this UASF defense very easy in the user interface because you just should be able to open a little menu and you should be able to see all the little train cars for side chain number six. And you should be able to say, well, that one's not correct. You just check a little box. And of course, there will be a little dialogue um, that shows up and says, well, you know, you, are you sure you know what you're doing? And here are the risks if you do this frivolously. And I'm going to explain those to you moments from now in this presentation. So, um, but what I'm trying to say is that the users will never be surprised because even if you wait for the train to go one, to get 4,000 spaces and get one third of the way there, that's going to take a month. And you can't do that per side chain. You, they can only promote one. So even after they do all that work, you still have two months to figure out what, if anything, you want to do about it. Uh, and I'm going to compare this to two things on the very next so slide. Um, another interesting thing about the timeline is that the miners don't know how many users, if any at all, are going to UASF defend until they try this thing later. And since it will probably work, they probably won't try, which means there'll probably only ever be one train, or it'll be very, very, very easy to tell which train is the real train. Even though all this is optional, 100% optional for users, um, and this is at the whim of the miners, I, I highly doubt that anyone would be willing to, well, you know, we'll see, you know, it's an interesting question, but let me get to this other stuff that I wanted to talk about with the user-activated software, because here's this guy, um, Here's what he's saying. My drive chains, mine side chains have a security flaw. So far, they count on social coordination as a check against miners maliciously updating state. This is a paradox, as mining is the method of social coordination to update state. Well, that's not always true because <clears throat> in the past, um, social coordination has successfully de um, usurped the miners in its uh, quest to update state. So. We had an incident uh, early on where um, someone cleverly tricked Bitcoin into giving them uh, like 184 billion Bitcoins. So that was kind of neat, but that was fixed within five hours. And then we have the March 2013 chain fork when uh, Mike Kern, oh, I cut it off there, but that took six hours. Uh, and um, you can look at these up if you don't believe me. I think people just don't believe that this happened. But there are, in fact, multiple cases where social coordination has trumped um, mining. And uh, I'm going to go more about this in the very next slide because the timeline's misunderstood. But the first thing that I want to mention is that these two examples that I've highlighted, they were emergencies. They happened after the fact, and they had to roll back the chain. But in drive chains happening three months before, and now I'm going to go more in more detail into that. So yellow is when the train is created and when the side chain node will immediately be warned of your malfeasance. And then three months pass from that until you can actually include the transaction in the main chain block, a transaction that hashes to the thing that you have been promoting. You've been hacking, as we call it, acknowledging. So if you do a user-activated soft fork, you will try to create a chain where this red thing is never allowed. And you'll know when the branch, you have the same branching off point as everyone else because it will be when or if this red thing is included in a block. So everyone can set, they can decide to user-activated soft fork over here in the previous, whenever they want. And they'll all be doing it at the same time, which may not be exactly three months, maybe it's any time. Whenever this red one is included in a block will be when that will be the block that you reject. Um, uh, and I think, so the timeline is different where you have, uh, the timeline is different because you have a lot of time in advance to 
uh, block the bad withdrawal, whereas in these previous examples, you had to block them after they had already happened, which is totally different. But it gets even better than that. What's your risk if you try to do the UASF and you fail? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's almost nothing. And people don't really believe this, but it really is almost nothing. I think they just don't know the issues at all. So let's say the miners are this blue line, and they just power right through this. They include the evil transaction. They get away with their theft, and they just keep going. What is going to happen to you over here? Well, actually, nothing. This will never be created because the miners are over here. Remember, the miners plowed right through it, so it didn't work. So you'll be stuck at this block. None of this will even exist. And so what happens if you try to do the UASF part, if you, what I'm saying, where you go open this little dialog box and you check some consensus critical thing and you say, I will not accept a block if it includes this red bar. Well, what happens? I mean, you don't lose any of your Bitcoin. You don't lose any of your Bitcoin. Um, you can still spend your Bitcoin because nothing about that will have changed. You just broadcast the transaction. You won't see. It will be a little confusing to you because it will look like it won't confirm, but it actually will be. And I'm speaking a little loosely in this section here, um, but in general, there's almost no downside to trying to do the, the UASF because um, nothing. there's no rollback, as I've stated, because the miners aren't over here. They're over there. They powered through it by definition. So the only real consequence is that you can't receive Bitcoin until you give up and you go and you uncheck the box and you say, fine, I allow the red one in there. Um, so you kind of just have the, block, the blockchain on pause, and then you can undo it at any time and, and catch right back up to where everyone else is. So that's something I don't think people appreciate, especially this guy does not. Um, uh, so he's saying blah, blah, blah. He's talking to Adam Back as if Adam Back doesn't know what he's talking about, and obviously he does. But he's saying that no bailouts if you bet wrong and lose, which is ironic because we'll get to that later. Uh, and he says... Media would have loved rollback of hacks, too. He's talking about Mt. Gox in an earlier tweet. But there is no rollback here. It's just the network just jams. In order for there to be a rollback, some of the miners would have to come with you. Uh, it's, it's, so it is possible that there is a rollback. If, if you scare a lot of the miners, a rollback is technically possible if you have, um, if the mining power were somehow split here, where a lot of people go down here, and they, they're intimidated by the UASF, and they do it themselves. And they say, we're not including the red one because we think it's UASF'd out. If so, uh, then you will have two chains, and they will both be growing. Um, and then eventually one chain will lose, and there will be a reorganization of some kind. But the reason that that is very unlikely is because if the mining, unless the mining power is overwhelmingly evil, like very high percent, the very fact that... Um, they'll either be, let me go back to the train, oh, excuse me, let me go back to the train. So you can't have like, if there's like some kind of ambivalence, then I like no one will be making progress. It'll look a little bit like this, where they'll be like kind of confused and there'll be no progress at all. And eventually they will all expire in six months. So you got to make it to 13,000, only one can. So the only reason that, um, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. The only reason that it would ever make it to the point where it could be included would be if you had a huge amount of evil hash power. So it'd have to be, I guess it could be very creepily evil where it would include this thing, planning to then defraud people by mining fake blocks on the other side. Um, it would never be, it would all these blocks they would mine, they would not reach the 100 block maturity window. So they it, this would all be lost their block rewards would all be lost for them, and they'd have to hash it full full difficulty to do this. But So anyway, for those reasons, maybe I could explain that better, but I really think a, a rollback, certainly a six-block rollback, is almost basically impossible. So the UASF is almost free, and it's not like you're going to be UASFing all kinds of things randomly. It's only if the train car starts seriously advancing that you'll even have to think about it. So I think... It's actually a lot stronger than people believe. Now, here we go. Uh, we're almost finished with this part. Um, what I'm saying here is that miners want to, this, their strongest incentive is to make sure that their coins are worth, worth the most money. 
So that's the strongest thing in their, uh, their payoff function here. And if sidechains are good, then if users enjoy them, then activating sidechains should increase the Bitcoin price. And if after the price increases, the equilibrium difficulty will eventually increase. And after the equilibrium difficulty increases to factor the sidechain benefit in, they will eventually reach a point where miners will only be able to remain profitable. This is very much an econ theory thing, so you can kind of ignore this, I guess, if you're not into this. But miners will only be able to remain profitable if they have a 100% support good sidechain policy. So what do I mean by that? It's a little bit like uh, sovereign debt, where they can't even talk. A nation can't even talk about defaulting on their debt. It's just for there to be any risk would be unconscionable. Now, but I have to have this blue box here because when I say they support all the good sidechains, that does not mean that they run sidechain nodes. It could mean something that requires no effort at all, which would be that they always alarm if there's ever more than one train. So in that case, they would be... Uh, although, of course, if they were a very big miner group, they could... Uh, if we had more than 51%, you could, of course... Um, put only one train on and then orphan everything that doesn't advance that one train. But the but if that were the case, then you would have 13,000 blocks of, of evidence of malfeasance, and then you could easily defeat it with the UASF, uh, at which point I think it would be much more like a SegWit UASF. But, you know, that... Uh, Part of this is uh, if people think that sidechains are a valuable uh, enterprise, which most people think that they are. And so when the when you go 13,000 blocks and then there's a split over whether or not they're allowed to steal, you have two networks that are basically exactly the same, except in one of them, miners stole from a sidechain. And in one of them, they did not. And I don't know why. Why would the one where miners stole be worth more? given that they're exactly the same, and stealing is universally agreed to be a bad thing, so I don't know why they would split, and I think people would want to pay more for the blockchain history that did not include theft, and that would draw all the miners back over. Now, I have a dumb comparison here between uh, DriveChain and Lightning, which I don't like, but uh, people basically forced me to do this, so I basically have to do it. And uh, I, the reason I don't like it is up here. This is main chain versus side chain versus lightning. So I'm going to compare regular Bitcoin to drive chain security model, and I'm going to compare that to Lightning Network's security model. And the reason I don't like to make this comparison is because uh, I think all three of them are secure. And this is going to be misconstrued as uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt about the Lightning Network, which is fine because everyone has already misconstrued just about everything. Um, so, like, I'm used to it. I don't care. But uh, I think all three are secure, and I love the Lightning Network, and I rewrote part of HiveMind as soon as I found out about the Lightning Network to make it more compatible with it. So I'm very excited about Lightning, and I think people should definitely try it if they feel comfortable using it. But I think that the Lightning Network security is worse than drive chain security, uh, and considerably so. So what I describe in the second bullet point up there is this mosquito strategy, where I say I would not attack the entire Lightning Network at once. I would just connect to random Lightning hub, hubs and try to defraud one or two channels a day or per hour, some small minority of the channels. And that type of attack is much more likely to succeed than any attack on uh, drive chain. And the reason is, first of all, that it's very hard to get other people to care enough to do anything about it in the mosquito world. And the second reason is that there's a bad incentive where the, the worse the Lightning Network is, the more pressure there is on main chain, on chain transaction fees to rise. So let me walk you through this. The, <clears throat> the way you steal in regular Bitcoin is with an intentional large six plus block chain reorganization. And the way you steal in drive chain, these are everything's a subset of this, so you can also steal with a large reorganization of these other two. Um, but that is needlessly complicating what I'm trying to the essence of what people are trying to say when they analyze these 
<clears throat> topic. So when you steal from drive chain, you advance the dishonest withdrawal 13,150 times. And when you steal from the lighting network, you broadcast an old channel state. Well, really, the second part is the important one, which is that you, you refuse to include the fraud proof into the blockchain ever under any circumstances, no matter how much transaction fees you're paid or whatever it is. But if you do that, you can steal from the Lightning Network. And all three are similar in that you will notice the fraud because your computer will be able to see that something that is Lightning Network channel shaped is not getting into the block, even though it has is valid and has a very high fee. So you'll be able to tell, and you'll be able to tell with this, because as I explained, it's only just one bit, whether or not two things match, true, false, every three months. So you'll be able to, you'll be able, the sidechain people will know. And obviously in regular Bitcoin, you'll notice when the chain reorganization reorganizes. So here's the first difference is that the attack requires 51% attack for seven blocks, which is 70 minutes in this first case, it requires it for an entire three months in this case. And with the Lightning Network, it is a uh, variable. It's a thousand blocks in the Lightning Network uh, white paper and in the presentation. I don't know if that's, I, I think two weeks was, was tossed around. That would be about 2,000 blocks. And you could have a Lightning Network channel that had a three month long custodial period or one that was even longer. But the point is, I think they're, they're aiming for a lot shorter than three months. So it's actually strictly um, more achievable to 51% attack the Lightning Network than drive chain. People say that it's not. I don't know why they say that. But the real problems are here, which is that if you d attack individual channels, you're just affecting one transaction. But if you do these other attacks, you are affecting many people. Since all the side chains have the same train metaphor security model, I think you really are affecting all the side chains. If you steal from one, people just assume the whole project is, is dead. So you're attacking all side chain users here. And if you reorg, you're attacking everything, all main side chains, all lightning channels, you're, you're um, attacking everything. And so the thing is, people will probably care if you do these two, but they may not care. They may say, well, I agree with you, but it's not my problem. And that's important because your recourse for this is the proof of work change, which is very difficult to do. And the recourse here is that UASF thing that I just mentioned earlier was actually very easy to do. And your recourse in the Lightning Network, I think, is the only the proof of work change, which is back to being very difficult. So it's, it's strictly worse in that way. Now, if the attack succeeds, obviously, I think the exchange rate would be falling in all three, which is one of the reasons why I think all three are secure and why the none will be attacked in any way at all. But if you attack these, these in the, the main chain Bitcoin or a side chain, then you can no longer expect people to have a strong demand for to transact in that system. Maybe you can cause some panic or something and people will want to, sell quickly or something like that. But on the sidechain, people will say, well, I'm not using sidechains anymore because they're insecure. People steal from them. So in these two groups, transaction fees fall. But if you screw up the Lightning Network, transaction fees are likely to rise because people can't use the Lightning Network now. So I don't know if anyone believes that or um, whatever, but that's just how I feel. I feel the three of them are very comparable. Um, and if anything, drive chains security is better actually but i don't know maybe people don't agree with that who knows it sort of does depend if there's like an infinite number of side chains but it's the thing is if you attack one side chain you probably are uh discouraging people from using all of them because you attack the entire model that it's based on okay there's definitely no time for this it's too bad um yeah but i'm talking about how it's basically impossible to criticize anything and blind merge mining allows miners to not even have to run a full node. So it's 100% the opposite of what Jorge Timon said when I began this talk. I don't have time to explain it right now. I'll give this talk later, but it was pretty cool. Now, here is the history of DriveChain. It's much older than SegWit. It solves everyone's problems and has zero drawbacks because it's 100% optional. Yet there is a suspicious lack of interest. So I have some, I think it's misunderstanding based. 
Oh, I think there's a lot of malice, certainly. It's not stupidity. There's a lot of malice. A lot of these things just can't be explained otherwise. But I do have some helpful comparisons. So if you have a complaint about sidechains or drive chain, you should try replacing the word sidechain with altcoin, and you should see if it still makes any sense. Now, altcoins, we obviously cannot prevent people from doing. Uh, but you, someone could argue, oh, altcoin, you know, why should they get Bitcoin's hash rate? Ah, but we have something counterparty, which is similar in that way and inherits the hash rate. And we also can't prevent it because it's a very nasty counterparty transactions hide inside of Bitcoin transactions. So there's a cat and mouse game. And I think, I think definitely um, it's basically unwinnable for Bitcoin to try to keep counterparty out of the chain. Although I guess it could try with uh, high transaction fees or something, but I don't really think so. Anyway, this first one here addresses a lot of the ecological concerns. People say weird things like, oh, the sidechain might become too popular. Or they say, oh, the sidechain would compete with Bitcoin on fees. Well, the bad news is we already have that happening. So drivechain doesn't change that aspect of reality um, at all in any way. So there's no logical foundation to this, uh, the ecological concerns. We already have over a thousand altcoins. So, But a second thing you could do is replace the sidechain with a website. And then here is this guy again. Um, talking about, well, why wouldn't we UASF out the Mt. Gox hack? As I've already explained, one reason, and the reason that Adam gives here is the timeline, but another reason is the transparency and the, the slowness and that it's directly associated with the reliability of the mining infrastructure. So those are other reasons. But in general, comparing a sidechain to a website is a very good idea because... <clears throat> Uh, the, because it addresses the argument and reframes the argument that, quote, people might lose their money, unquote. It's actually desirable for people to lose their money if it's on a side chain that sucks. Um, so the fetish for 100% security is not, it's not attainable and it is also not desirable. And you can imagine, um, like imagine if every website had to go to Bitcoin Dev mailing list for approval, and then the people on the mailing list um, complained, and they said, well, this website isn't explained enough, or they said, this website, is, the explanations are too long, and we didn't read them. Or they say, no one needs this website, because we already have, you know, our one website, and the internet only needs one website. Um, so, and it's... You know, we don't need any competition because we're providing the only website on the entire internet. So why would people need any other website? What's wrong with the one that they're getting from us? Suspiciously. Uh, you can see how the, the web would be a terrible place. And so we want, we don't want perfection. We want people to be moving fast and breaking things, so to speak. And we want improvement and we want progress. So we want safe imperfection. That's the philosophy here. And that's the difference between drive chain and like these other things like check sequence verify or whatever, check lock time verify, um, that people don't understand. Is that the part that has to be perfect is the train part, the metaphor, and all the you know the code for drive chain and keeping track of these withdrawals. But the idea that a, a side chain might be imperfect and that it might have flaws. That might be like the DAO. That is a good thing because that's how we get improvement. That's how we get anti-fragility. -fragil so we want, in a sense, there's a real sense in which we want people to lose money if they pick the wrong sidechain. But that, because that's how we encourage people to write good sidechains. So I have this joke here, jihanwuwallet.com. Um, yeah, if people put their money in jihanwuwallet.com, can they really complain if it goes missing? Maybe not, but maybe if they put it in something that is well designed, it's uh, it's less likely to happen. So this is just something that I think people do not understand at all. Now I do want to talk about this point here. I want to sell. I want to try to sell this point because a lot of people don't believe it, and and Giacomo says that it's a conspiracy, even though no conspiracy is 
uh, part of it at all, and as I'll explain, but he says that I have a theory about Kor and him fearing the side chain concept because it kills experts. He's obviously speaking metaphorically there. I'm saying is it competes with experts and makes them unnecessary. And the reason why it's interesting that he himself brings it up is because he is the CEO of a, of a company that has a, a very concise mission statement in one sentence. You should go to Blockchain Lab. Dot Italy and check it out and it says our lab is the place where we nurture the strongest community of experts in the field hence providing enterprises with the skills to understand and use the blockchain technology so he's selling expertise here and my claim and another claim that a lot of people have made uh, this is Richard Feynman scientists belief in the ignorance of experts but I happen to know that I mean the seem to lab is a big fan of Karl Popper certainly more than not and that is the school of thought here, as well as Milton Friedman, and we'll get to this, which is to say that we don't want the best experts to be in charge. We want a process that recovers from error, and that's why mining works, because it doesn't matter which miners are in charge. The point is just that if something happens, like what happened to Liberty Reserve or whatever, eGold, the process will recover. If miners do something bad, we can change the proof of work or something will happen to help us recover from error. That is what we really want. We do not want to put certain people in charge. That is centralization, although the word centralization is overused, so I don't like to use it. But the point is that human progress is really about um, eliminating the need for experts. That's my point of view. I strongly believe it's in the Seam to Labs point of view. And I also think it's Richard Feynman and Milton Friedman's. Obviously, I can't speak for them. But I do want to read you something to make my case about this. It's a paragraph from this thing here. You can read it for yourself. Why does the free market have such a bad press? By Milton Friedman, 1966. So I'm going to read this to you to see if you can make this case. Because he's what he said was that it's random, unsensical uh, BS. It's certainly not random because obviously I'm getting it from his own website, but I don't think it's unsensical either because just see if you just take a gander at this and just let me know what you think of it, okay? These comments suggest the final reason I want to mention why free enterprise has such a bad press, especially among intellectuals. The role of the intellectual is more limited in a free society than it is in a controlled society. I was most impressed with this as I talked to the able, intelligent people at the University of Malaysia. In a planned collectivist society, they are the ones who are going to sit in the seats of power and to whom the businessmen are going to have to come for import permits, licenses, and so on. They are the ones who are going to attend the international conferences and meetings. Let Malaysia follow the path of a free society and their role will be very different. The minority Chinese in Malaysia are the most effective and energetic businessmen and hence will be in the positions of power in a free market society. The intellectuals will be reduced to being their advisors or simply teachers in a university. Of course, no intellectual will say this explicitly, but implicitly he knows well that he can run the country better than they can. End quote. Well, you know, I don't know, international conferences, businessmen coming to ask for permission. It's just certainly something for you to think about. Uh, I didn't really get it from nowhere. I got it from... Uh, Milton Friedman, who is a genius, so <clears throat> it's just something for you to think about, maybe. Even if there's no monetary compensation, it is kind of cool for, at the end of the day, for someone to be like, oh, Brian Armstrong at Coinbase, billion-dollar unicorn company, he wants this, but we stopped him from getting it. You know, you can get a really kind of perverse feeling of importance Um by doing something like that and obviously I mean I don't want to I'm not I'm not sure that I can really convey to someone who doesn't know a lay person how comfortable if you have there are two different types of developers right there are the kind that do all the work and you've never heard of them and they're the kind whose name you know and they have a personal brand and if you have a personal brand you know you're constantly getting invited to all these things all expense paid you have a lot of you have basically infinite freedom to do this review lots of money there's a very 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 nice uh, life it's very comfortable so no one will say explicitly exactly as Milton Friedman says and writes in this part that no one will say oh we want to be the important people who go to all the international conferences and 
who are the high status people. Um, no one will say that, but there is another. So like I proposed a different idea that would have fixed scalability, which is the fork futures idea. And that was the idea that eventually killed Segwit2x because they looked at the futures prices and they said, well, you know, we're only in for 12 hours. That's what they said. But then we're going to have to revert to whichever one is more profitable. And the futures, the fork futures revealed that it would actually be the 1x side that would be more profitable. And, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Like, that was what I said would happen when I wrote about that in July 2015 and when I presented it at Scaling Montreal. Uh, and I well, I don't know why, well, I do know why now. So the question is, why weren't these experts up here and the experts that, you know, um, Giacomo is talking about, why weren't they interested in killing Bitcoin XT in that way? And the suggestion is just that it's because that way didn't involve them. So I don't know if you believe that or not, but I did want to bring it up. Now, this concludes the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the goal is to defeat altcoin competition and resolve scalability conflict permanently in a win-win way. We solve governance. We solve protection against hard fork campaigns influencing the developers to trick them into releasing bad software. It really covers everything. I mean, this project is, um, I think, the most important Bitcoin project. I think it's certainly more important than uh, the Lightning Network or SegWit. I mean, we, we see that in the numbers. When, when the market share is below 50%, when it's at 33% or something, it implies that an interoperability solution is objectively more valuable than anything that is expected to happen inside Bitcoin itself. So I don't know if you agree with that or not. You probably don't. But I love the Lightning Network, and I think all kinds of people are doing awesome things in Bitcoin, and this is one of them. That's just what I think. Um, obviously, I was only trying to help when I invented this technology and wrote about it and devoted my scarce time towards trying to promote it. Uh, I was also trying to look like a hero and a genius, I suppose. Um, but I think, I mean, what is doing anything to tackle these really big problems? You know, a lot of people think we can just compete with uh, Ethereum or these other altcoins, we can just compete by being better at technology. But I don't know if that's really the case, you know. Um, the QWERTY keyboard is a terrible keyboard layout. But everyone learns that one because they don't know when they're going to be, they know they're going to find a QWERTY keyboard whenever they go in the world. Maybe they'll find a Dvorak keyboard option, maybe they won't. So Esperanto was supposed to be the best language simplest, easiest to learn, but no one cares about that because of network effects. So I don't know, you can imagine a situation where Ethereum implements a kind of hacked together version of sidechains. They do mandatory extension blocks or something, something that's dumb, but that they can just hack together in two weeks. And at the same time, the government cracks down on Bitcoin and there's a lot of hype from, you know, the, the, the Ethereum hype machine and these ICOs and this other stuff that could pump Ethereum up and then and then you know I think Bitcoin could be finished because I think there's only one and I just you know it's weird for me that no one is tackling these big problems and no one could figure out that the scalability thing was not about transactions per second it was about Luke Jr. wants to spend less resources running a node Roger Veer doesn't understand where we don't spend more so it's quite, uh, I, you know, we have Greg Maxwell, Roger Veer uh, fighting each other when they should be working together. Who's doing anything about that? You know, no one. The market share is below, not only is it below 50%, it's below 35%. It's like 30%. So I don't really understand why people want to roll the dice on these big threats. Um they don't do make they don't make any effort into really understanding this project at all. So that's kind of my complaint. Um, but anyway, version of one of the code is finished thanks to Cryptax and Ben Goldhaber rebased it to Bitcoin Core, which is like 65,000 lines of code. 
Um, but we do, I would like code review because I'm sure I could probably get this activated uh, even without code review, but there should be code review. So um, feel free to review the code. There are issues on GitHub. If there's a question of paying people for their time, I'm happy to do that. But um, I don't think there's any point in me asking for a code review when there's so little effort put into even understanding the idea in the first place. Although I will say part of that is on me. So now I have this giant talk. It's much longer than I thought it would be, but there you are. And here's the talk is now finished. So thanks very much. Bye. Until next time.